there is so much opportunity in the air right now to do so many important things. And I'm trying to play my part as someone who's still relatively young, even though politics has made me prematurely very gray, uh, that that is a very strong motivator for me right now. I believe if we make the right decisions now, if we all become involved in our local environment and even politically involved, where many of us maybe don't want to really do that, um, now is really the moment to think again, because in two years' time, we're going to have the opportunity to fundamentally change this country. Hello, my name is Donald, and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our worldview. Today, we're talking with Dr. Leon Schreiber. The doctor is a member of parliament for the DA and the shadow minister of public service and administration. He is the author of the book, Coalition Country, South Africa after the ANC. Doctor, welcome. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. Thanks, Donald. You're very welcome to just call me Leon because I'd hate for anyone to get the impression that I'm a medical doctor, which would be very dangerous. So <laughs> it's lovely to be here. So, Leon, uh, why did you join? Why did you become a member of parliament? I, I read on your Wikipedia article something about you became um, disillusioned with the stance of universities in regards to Afrikaans. Can you perhaps tell us that story? So I think those are actually two different questions. Um, the first one is my background before joining politics really um, <clears throat> kind of set me on, on this road. So I studied in Germany. I did my PhD there. And then I was fortunate enough to start working at Princeton University in the US, where I did research on um, successful government reform programs in developing countries. So uh, I had the opportunity to really travel all across the developing world, Africa, East Asia, um, and to experience some of the the positive things that that were happening in some of these developing countries and to see kind of examples, I guess, of, of what's possible. So um, in that experience, the thing that stood out for me the most was the fact that, you know, you can have very talented people as we do in South Africa, you can have good ideas um, and, and all of the other ingredients. But if you don't have political will at the top, at the end of the day, whether that's in government departments or at state-owned enterprises or whatever the case may be, um, you're very unlikely to, to really make sustainable improvements. And uh, that was really a lesson that I took to heart and, and in 2016 came back to South Africa, continued working with Princeton for a while, but um, really felt like that was the opportunity with the 2019 election approaching for me to get involved. And I've, uh, I'm a very, very strong supporter of the DA, obviously, um, consider myself to be a liberal, and it was really quite natural to um, for me to take that next step. So the idea basically is to play my part in making sure that we get the kind of political pressure and hopefully with the DA uh, in more governments after 2024 to get into positions where you can actually influence uh, positive reforms in the country. I think there's a lot of consensus around kind of economic reforms and social reforms that we do need. But what's clearly lacking, and, and also under President Ramaphosa, is the will to actually make it happen. The second question you ask about the language issue, um, I mean, that's also something that has been coming for me personally for a while. I used to be a member of the Institutional Forum at Stellenbosch University, and really a very passionate believer in mother tongue education and, and the opportunities that that actually creates. And, and I really believe that if you look at the really poor education outcomes you see in South Africa, even um, sort of in primary school, if you look at those standardized tests, a huge problem is the fact that a majority of South African learners, a vast majority, actually don't go to school, uh, not even to speak of university, uh, in the language that they understand best. So it's really something that I think is holding us back educationally. And when I saw Stellenbosch University as one of the last places where uh, tuition was being offered in an indigenous South African language, really turning away from that uh, with a 2016 language policy. Um, it was an issue that I also took up and, and continue to take up uh, as we speak. Hello, everyone. If you're interested in advertising on Worldview, drop us an email at worldview.help at gmail.com. We will send you an advertisement guide, which will include the rates and the process involved. A typical shout out for your company or project will be between 45 and 60 seconds.
By advertising on our platform, you'll be supporting a company that wants to improve the public narrative. Once again, send us an email at worldview.help at gmail.com, which you can also find in the description below. Now, back to the interview. Okay, so Leon, um, perhaps I'm being stupid, but um, you can perhaps enlighten me on this Afrikaans issue in regards to universities. An institution like Stellenbosch University is a private institution. It, it doesn't work for the state. Am I correct? No, it is a state institution. It's a oh. public university. And so, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a private institution. Okay, so in that regard, okay, it makes sense. And what is the st statistics in terms of how many people, how many pupils are Afrikaans in Stellenbosch University? So, so just on the first point about uh, public institutions, um, Stellenbosch University, like all universities, are subject to the constitution. And section 29 of the constitution is very clear on language rights and the right of um, South Africans to study in their preferred language where that is reasonably practicable. Now, it's obviously been practicable at Stellenbosch for more than 100 years. It's really the place where academic Afrikaans was developed um, more than anywhere else. And so um, that's the, the framework within which uh, this operates. In terms of the statistics, first of all, in the Western Cape, um, the vast majority, more than 50% of people um, speak Afrikaans at home. We also know that there are three universities within 60 kilometer radius of Stellenbosch that is completely anglicized. And um, as for the student population itself, it, it remains a, a large share of the student population at Stellenbosch remains Afrikaans speaking. Although there have been some changes to uh, those numbers, principally, I believe, because of the way in which the Afrikaans offering has been reduced. So if you think about it in terms of the quality that's been declining when it comes to things like notes being translated in class, or when it comes to just the quality of your lectures in Afrikaans, if that is declining, it's actually a kind of built in incentive for people to no longer study in Afrikaans because it's just not on, on par with what the English offering is. So my view is that instead of taking away uh, places or, or opportunities where we can uh, teach and offer learning and education in an indigenous language, we should be expanding that. There are so many other um, situations, uh, millions of people. We have nine other official languages that also uh, deserve uh, to be elevated as per the constitution to enjoy that kind of parity and equality. And it's going to open massive doors. Just think about educational problems in the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal as examples, and the opportunity of actually um, uh, ending this practice where very young children all the way through to university are actually not able to compete on an equal footing with English speaking people. Um, so this is not about not being able to speak English, of course, along the way, it's critical that we develop that competence uh, in a global world where we want to compete. But I think all the studies will show you that you are first able to master concepts, including the ability to learn other languages in the language that you understand best. So if I understand you correctly, it's not necessarily about Afrikaans, it's about teaching a person in its indigenous language. So for example, KwaZulu-Natal, that would be, for example, Zulu or in the Eastern Cape Corsa. Absolutely. And so, you know, the DA has been working on this issue more broadly than just Stellenbosch. If you look at our spokesperson on basic education, uh, Bakrolilio Nodada, he's from the Eastern Cape and is working very hard against uh, proposed amendments to the Basic Education Act, which would uh, essentially take away the power from school governing bodies to determine their own language policies. And, and because of his pushback and his work in this portfolio, we've actually recently seen the basic education minister, Angie Mochekha, um, saying that there's going to be expanded investment in developing textbooks, uh, dual language textbooks, teachers, other resources for other indigenous South African languages. And I really wish we could get to that point where we understand that this is not a, a either or or a kind of a, a battle between languages. But in reality, we should preserve the rights that do exist for Afrikaans speaking South Africans to study in their mother tongue and actually use those resources and skills to expand learning and teaching in other languages. So it's positive to see the minister making uh, some of these noises now after we've been working really hard on this issue. Uh, and we do hope that it's carried out, but it is certainly uh, something that goes far beyond just Stellenbosch. It just so happens that uh, I'm, I guess I'm quite vocal on this issue. And so people do take note. Why do you think the opposition to this is framed in terms of, okay, 
you guys just want to uh, recreate apartheid and just every institution must speak Afrikaans. Why do you think they frame it like that? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question because obviously this issue has never been about saying everything has to be Afrikaans. It's about saying that there has to be access in a province where that's the majority language for people to exercise their constitutional rights. So it's highly disingenuous and dishonest to frame it that way. But I think it's because uh, the, the old frame, the old narrative about Afrikaans somehow being an oppressor's language and the language of white people still um, persists to this day, unfortunately. And the reality couldn't be more different. Uh, the, the vast majority of Afrikaans speakers in South Africa today are not white. They are also not economically uh, in the elite. Uh, they tend to be working class uh, people from uh, all across the country, really, but with majorities in the Western Cape and the Northern Cape. So the question to ask is who's really being disadvantaged? Uh, we know that at the moment, because of the failure to expand education in other languages, it is mainly the Afrikaans community that still has schools that will teach children all the way to grade 12 in Afrikaans. Now, just imagine having uh, maybe gone to a school in a sort of uh, rural area and uh, your whole schooling career has been in Afrikaans and now you show up to the one university that you think is offering you the opportunity to study in this language and suddenly you're confronted by um, complete uh, sort of anglicization or or, or, or much more English than you anticipated or were ever used to. I mean, it is really unfair, uh, that situation. It is not the fault of these students or learners that they went to Afrikaans schools. And in fact, it's not a bad thing that there are Afrikaans schools. The point is that you then have to also cater to the needs of that community. Um, and that's what this is all about. And, and frankly, if it was up to me, uh, we would start seeing uh, schools that are also teaching in other indigenous languages in the same way, going up to ensure that uh, more South Africans have access to these opportunities. And then universities should also start taking up that, uh, that challenge. The one positive example does come from the UKZN, where um, they have actually instituted a requirement that um, all first year students have to uh, study Zulu as well, because if they're going to work in that region, it's obviously massively beneficial and going to help you, if you're a doctor or a nurse or a lawyer, to actually engage with your clients. So some of these things are really just no-brainers. If you look at the issues, unfortunately, uh, this has a lot to do with ideology. And Minister Bladen Zamande is no friend of, of Afrikaans or of the indigenous languages in general. And uh, therefore, there's a strong push by, uh, let's say, acolytes of his in many universities to really push through this kind of anglicization. Um, against Afrikaans, but also indigenous languages in general. Yeah, that's it's sort of ironic that a member, okay, well, not ironic because he's a member of the South African Communist Party. If you understand the Communist Party, you would understand what he's doing. I mean, he's trying to centralize authority, he's trying to create one language um, in South Africa. So that, that's his aim. I mean, he doesn't care about the average person. He wants everyone to speak English to serve communism. I think the centralization impulse is very much part of this. And perhaps the last thing I would say on this is that it's also a much bigger issue. The language at Stellenbosch is one manifestation. But if you look more broadly, what's happening at our universities is, is a complete ideological onslaught. Um, and to be very honest with you, the case study of the University of Cape Town, I know this, this, this great new book by David Benatar about the fall of UCT. Um, in which actually documents a lot of what's going on under this new kind of centralizing race uh, ideology that's playing out there. And instead of, in Stellenbosch, it's just manifesting in a different way. It's manifesting there because of uh, the fact that Afrikaans uh, until recently was still an, an equal language there. Um, but we, we shouldn't be under any illusions. It's not an isolated thing. It's part of a bigger push for centralization, as you say. It's, a, it's very much ideologically informed. And I think what many opponents of this uh, issue perhaps did not see coming was the fact that the Democratic Alliance uh, has certainly in the last few years really stepped up to the plate in a much more vocal way in general against this kind of centralization and concentration of power. So whether it's on language rights, whether it's on the district development model, whether it's on expropriation without compensation, whether it's on the national health insurance, on each of these things, COVID regulations, you'll find the DA right in front in a much more aggressive way, certainly uh, than a few years ago, pushing back with our own uh, view on things. And that is that we need more federalism and not more concentration and centralization. 
Leon, the, the, the title of Shadow Minister of Public Service and Administration, are you the opponent of Pravin Gordon? Well, how does that work? So um, um, Pravin Gordon is the Minister of Public Enterprises. Um, my minister for a long time was Senzo Kunu. Then I recently had Ayanda Glodlo. And now Tulas Nesi is actually acting in that position. But the portfolio is about public service, about essentially the state bureaucracy. So the big issue that I have been working on, and, and there's more to come on this front in the coming few weeks, is cater deployment. And the fact that uh, this system of, of employing people in the public service, in the public administration, on the basis of loyalty and membership to the ANC, is really at the root of state capture and corruption in South Africa. If you think about, you know, and what we've managed to do, I got my hands on those minutes from the ANC's cater deployment committee. So we were actually able to show South Africans even though it was only over a three year period, um, how these um, meetings actually, uh, they happen in reality. There's a small <laughs> smoke filled room, perhaps somewhere in Lituli House or at a hotel. Uh, we know the St. George's Hotel is a favorite of them. And uh, the ANC's cater deployment committee actually gets together and decides who gets appointed to which positions in the state. And you've got a whole appointment process that's running, but it's turned into a complete sham by this um, secretive group who meet in the background and, and pull the strings. And that is the foundation of state capture. It means that the state has been captured by the ANC to serve the needs and interests of the ANC rather than to serve the public as the name public service would suggest. And so uh, we've worked very hard to ensure that as part of the Zondo Commission investigations, uh, cater deployment is put front and center and interrogated uh, along with all of the things we know about the Guptas and other people involved. Because my fundamental point is that if there wasn't a system like cater deployment through which the ANC already controlled and captured the state, the Guptas would never have been able to capture the ANC and, and get everything done in the way that they did. So um, we hope now with the finals on the report coming out in June, that this issue will be um, really front and center. But uh, that's really my main focus in my portfolio. That's the thing I work on day and night, basically pushing back against cater deployment because as I mentioned in the beginning, when you travel around the world and you understand how countries develop, the most critical ingredient of all is a public service that is not politicized and beholden to any political party, where people are appointed on the basis of merit and competence and their ability to do the job. That's it. It really sounds very simple and in a way it is. But again, because of this ideological impulse, the ANC's national democratic revolution and this desire to really control every sphere of, of society and of the state, certainly for its own benefit, we've ended up with the opposite in the form of cater deployment. So I'm hopeful that this is something that we definitely are making real progress on, and hopefully we can get to a point where we get this thing eradicated, and, and that's really going to be my focus for the next uh, remainder of this term, certainly. Mm. And during some of these meetings, a lot of Johnny Walker blues are drink, but um, drunk. But um, Leon, um, so, so the, the person that officiates these meetings is the deputy president. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's Cyril Ramaphosa. I mean, during President Zuma's tenure. So Cyril Ramaphosa knew of all of this. Yes, that is one of the, the key implications of all of this. And again, I'm really looking forward to the, the final Zonda report because uh, Judge Zondo has made it clear that they will be dealing with cadre deployment in that final report. So um, what, what happened was that we initially submitted a request in terms of the PIA Act. So this is the Promotion of Access to Information Act, where we asked the ANC for copies of minutes of these meetings, precisely because, as you say, we need to know whether the president, uh, to what extent he was involved. We already know he was the chairperson of this committee under um, Jacob Zuma. So we asked the ANC for minutes and all other kinds of records dating back to 2013, which is when Ramaphosa became the chairperson. Uh, the ANC then said, no, we can't have it. Uh, they never said that it, the, the minutes don't exist. They just said, we can't have it. And we said, well, we, we disagree and we've taken them to court on that basis. But in the meantime, we also wrote to the Zondo Commission and we informed them that we've asked for these uh, documents uh, the ANC has refused and we've gone to court, but we believe that the State Capture Commission um, has to also take a look at this and actually use its powers to get hold of these records. And lo and behold, the State Capture Commission did exactly that. They wrote to the president and to the ANC and said, um, 
essentially these guys have a point. They didn't put it in those terms. But, but of course, it is correct to say that you have to then look at those records. And then interestingly, uh, the ANC responded by saying, well, um, these records only exist since 2018. In other words, they do not exist for the period when Ramaphosa was the chairperson, but they suddenly come into existence uh, after he stops being the chairperson, which is incredibly suspicious. Um, but they do make those records then available to the Zondo Commission and the DA obtains it and, and we sort of analyze and we've, we've laid some complaints with the Public Service Commission and we'll be following up on those. Um, but in the meantime, our court case is continuing because we simply don't believe that those records just disappeared. There's no way that they didn't exist. And um, perhaps the best piece of evidence in this regard is in the first set of minutes, which I believe was a meeting in May of 2018. Uh, so the ANC says this is the first minutes. There's nothing prior to this. The first item in those minutes is adoption of the previous minutes. So it is very, very clear that there has to be at least <laughs> that set of prior minutes, which they did not share with us or with the Zondo Commission. Um, so I think they know that they're in serious trouble with this issue. I think the president understands that this is going to directly implicate him because you can't be the chairperson of this committee and then say you were innocent in the appointments of these people who captured the state. So we are going to continue to pursue this. Um, I think it's a really exciting area that we're working on. Um, it, in, in some cases, as you can hear from, from what's going on, it is a bit complicated. You know, there's a lot of moving parts, but, um, you know, I try to keep it together in my head and, and really think that we are moving towards a really focused resolution here, which is that we must get this thing declared unconstitutional. It must be outlawed and we must prevent it from actually ever happening again and then hold accountable the people uh, who were practicing carry deployment. And that's, of course, the ANC and includes the president. And we, we've um, seen in these minutes that they've appointed judges to the, I, I believe it was the Constitutional Court even, that some of them were appointed via these cater deployment meetings. Yes, that is by far the most staggering thing to come out of it. So, you know, since 1997, when this policy was adopted, the ANC has never made a secret of, of, of practicing cater deployment. I mean, they were always... Uh, in all the, the conference resolutions, it is mentioned there. So they didn't hide it. But what we never previously knew is the, the extent and the reach of the system. And the fact that, uh, you know, the appointments to the Constitutional Court were discussed in a meeting by the Secretive Committee, this was in 2019. And then some of those names mentioned are in fact appointed it raises very, very serious questions that go right to the heart of the separation between party and state. Uh, and, and I really hope that in the judicial sphere, my understanding is that, you know, people who work there, professionals who work in the legal sector are very upset about the contents of these minutes. And it's just one more thing that I hope um, gets our courts and, 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 and everyone else to recognize just how serious this is when you're actually interfering with the highest court in the land. The other thing that stands out is, uh, again, something that wasn't made a secret of, but, you know, it's, it's, it's different to have it confirmed in, in, in these official minutes, is that th there's not just one cadre deployment committee. What we're talking about here is the minutes from the national committee, but there are, in fact, nine provincial committees and a number of regional committees as well. So it is very, very likely that when you go to your home affairs, your local home affairs, um, there are cadres deployed from a regional committee who then at the same time report to people, people at the provincial level who were influenced by a provincial ANC cadre deployment committee. And finally, at national level, people like directors general or other officials uh, who were appointed or influenced or interfered with by the national cadre deployment committee. So, I mean, it is a system of capture. It is, it is an ideological project. And the ANC, again, has been very, very clear about this right from the start. Uh, in, 97, in 1997 at the Mafeking conference, they published this um, infamous document by Joel Netzicenze, who, who blatantly said, this is about capturing all levers of power in the state and in society. He listed the judiciary, he listed the armed forces, he listed all of these things. So what we are seeing now is the consequences of 20 years of this policy. And we have been warning along the way, we've been uh, confronting individual deployees along the way as the DA. 
But I hope what we're able to do now is that we're actually able to attack the whole system itself. And, you know, if we succeed, we will be ripping the heart out of the ANC's ideological project. Mm. Let's not make a mistake about it. That's what this is about. I think the ANC understands this. I certainly understand it, that this is fundamental to their worldview, <laughs> ironically, given the name of this channel, that they want to actually control every single piece of society to their own benefit. If we can stop cater deployment, if we can really root it out going forward and make it impossible for them to continue doing this, we will have won not only an ideological victory, but something that really gives us the chance to finally start building a capable state where people are appointed not because they support a particular party or because they channel money to a particular party, but because they have the skills to do the job. Just a final point, if I may. Uh, recently, I mean, really a month ago, there was a revelation around uh, an affidavit that was submitted to the Zondo Commission in February of last year, where someone, a senior official who was working in the Department of International Relations, <clears throat> actually put on record before the State Capture Commission that not only did the ANC decide who would be ambassadors and other senior officials in the Cater Deployment Committee, but they actually made all those people sign debit orders to deduct 2,000 rand a month from their salaries in order to fund the ANC. So this is wow. a racketeering criminal syndicate. And it, as I say, you cannot get a more fundamental um, uh, instrument for the ANC than cater deployment. And I hope if the DA can, can win this victory and if we're able to, to really root this out, uh, that South Africans realize the enormity of what this is about because it is, is literally the foundation of the criminal state. Um, so stay tuned, but I do hope, and I am optimistic that there will be some positive developments going forward. Yeah, I mean, that would explain why so many local home affairs officers are in a la canon, so to speak. <laughs> but, but Leon, um, so what, what would be structural changes to solve this issue? Because I mean, I, for example, I'm not satisfied with the argument, okay, if John Stianazen comes in, everything will be solved just by his personality. There, there has to be structural systemic yes. changes. What would be those changes to solve this problem once and forever? No, you're absolutely right. Because I think the whole value proposition of the DA should be and is that we should get into government so that we can make structural changes. It's not, you know, the DA is certainly not one of those personality cult political parties. We are about programs. And we are about delivery and, and that's what we try to do wherever we govern. So it is absolutely right that we will need a systemic response um, to reform our entire bureaucracy, our entire um, state, in fact. Now, there are solutions. Again, this is my, uh, the advantage that I have is having been to so many of these other places that were grappling with very similar problems. You can see that there are solutions that work. And, and it's not only developing countries that go through this. If you look at the history of the United States, of the UK, and of course, Germany, um, you'll see that there were periods of exactly the same kind of patronage system uh, where, you know, a new government would come in and fire the whole bureaucracy and put all its friends in there and things would go from bad to worse. Another government comes and does the same thing. But every country that has been successful, and even including countries that are, I believe, not sustainable in terms of the economic model, if you think about China and some other places. But they've, even there, you, they've been able to build um, functional bureaucracies, which is what we're talking about here, because they outlawed, you, you know, this idea of just anyone can get in if you pay enough money or, or, or something like that. So you have merit-based entrance exams as one exam, uh, example. In many cases, you have dedicated civil service training institutes that actually create civil servants the way that you would train doctors. It, you know, it is, a, it is a high level skill to be a senior bureaucrat in any state. Uh, and then of course, you know, in a democracy, so not like China, but in a democracy like South Africa and many other places, we have to make it impossible for people to hold senior positions in political parties and also work for the state. Now, if you look at what just happened in the Eastern Cape, one of the people elected to the ANC's um, uh, provincial committee there is a municipal manager in the Eastern Cape. So that is exactly the kind of thing that should not be happening. We should not have politicians being bureaucrats and civil servants at the same time. You have to make a choice. 
And you can, you can change your mind later. You can shift from the one to the other. But you can't be a politician and a civil servant at the same time. And then the last legal change that I would like to see, and the good news is that we actually have submitted uh, our end cater deployment bill to parliament, and it will be uh, on the parliamentary agenda in June, so in about a month's time, uh, is to give the Public Service Commission vastly more power uh, over the appointment uh, and dismissal process in the, in the public service. So, you know, the interim constitution between 1994 and 96 had very strong powers for the Public Service Commission. So this would have been an independent body that would control on a professional basis who gets appointed and who doesn't get appointed. The ANC removed those provisions for a very good reason, because they understood that, was be, that would be the thing that would prevent cater deployment from happening. So now we're back to square one. We have to go back to some of those provisions. We have to make them stronger in some cases, and we have to build, rebuild the Public Service Commission to make sure that it is politically independent. Because unfortunately, even that institution is populated by ANC cadres in many cases. So we've got a big job in front of us, but you are absolutely right. This is not just about saying, you know, uh, here are the problems and we'll wave a magic wand and it'll be fixed. Um, we have a very, very clear plan of action for what should happen on the day that we hopefully get cadre deployment declared unconstitutional or, or scrapped in some other way, because then there's still a whole lot of work to ensure that some other political party doesn't just come along and do the same thing. We actually have to prevent this from happening across the board. Uh, and we know our democracy is becoming more competitive. So now really is the time to insulate the public service and build an independent state away from politics and, uh, and let professionals really run uh, government. Leon, a lot of people like to talk about um, term limits for politicians, but what do you think of the, the idea of term limits for bureaucrats? So uh, there's a long debate that's going on about this at the municipal level, especially, but also nationally and provincially. At the moment, the top bureaucrats, directors general, for example, or municipal managers uh, at the municipal level, they're actually um, limited to five-year contracts. So there is, a, your contract can be renewed, but it is, it is a contract. It's not a permanent appointment. Um, so there are arguments saying this is the right way because it makes, you know, there's at least a time limit. If you get a bad official or a cadre, then you can remove them. And if you look at what happened in Johannesburg recently, where the ANC tried to permanently employ 120 people who were politically appointed, and the big fight that the DAs had and, and Mayor and Paul Palazzi has won that fight, um, to actually say, but these people cannot be permanently employed. Those are some of the tricks that we know will take place. But I think if we get to a point where we can train civil servants properly, where we have proper entrance requirements into the civil service in the form of exams or other objective criteria, where we have the Public Service Commission making sure there's no cater deployment and that things are done on a fair basis. If we can do those things, then I think the ideal is actually to have longer contracts in the public service. Because if you're, if you're attracting professionals, skilled people, you actually want to give them that security. You don't want to give that security to cadres and corrupt people, of course. So you must first make those reforms and make sure you've got confidence in who is getting appointed. But I do think if we can get to that point, which is further down the line from what we're speaking about now, then I think that's a worthwhile thing to consider uh, because certainly I think the job security, uh, we know how scarce good officials are. And if we can have a system that really attracts good officials, I think we should reward them. Uh, but that's a discussion, I think, for a little bit further down the road. For now, we have to get rid of the bad apples that um, are really unfortunately everywhere. Leon, you, you published your book, Coalition Country, in 2018. And I know... In political terms, a year is like a lifetime. I mean, a lot of things can change from 2018. So now it's 2022. What would be your updated, unwritten version of that book? That is a fantastic question, uh, Donald. I have been thinking about that on a daily basis as I watch uh, these coalitions actually playing out in practice. So, um, you know, that book came at a time when very few people were thinking about this seriously. People were still very much trapped in this idea that the ANC is going to dominate everything. And of course, we've seen that changing very rapidly with the ANC now losing its 50% majority. It lost it in the 2021 election. I think it got 46%. And there's a very real chance that it will lose in Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal 
and perhaps even nationally in the upcoming 2024 election. So some of the things that I would update is that the fracturing of the political landscape has been far more intense than I thought would be the case. So we've seen in the last few years the emergence of an enormous number of smaller parties where people are taking advantage of the electoral system, especially at local level, to just get one seat or two seats or a handful of seats and then they can end up determining who is in power. And of course, in many cases, they can then use that influence to get contracts or other things that, uh, that benefit them. So I think the, 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 the continued fracturing of the political landscape is one thing. And I think it's a, it's a very real risk because if you look at other coalition countries in the world, they tend to have you know, four or five quite big parties that um, you know they, they go up and down. It's not like they have the same vote share all the time. But you know, if you have 20, 25 percent in a country like Germany or the Netherlands or many others, that's a very substantial block. And you know, often you become the government. And if you look at Angela Merkel, um, it was very rare for her to even for her party to get 30 percent. But now what's happening in South Africa is that we're not sort of fracturing to the point of four or five parties. We're fracturing way beyond that. And I think that's where ungovernability becomes a real risk. Because, you know, in Ekuruleni at the moment, we've got a minority coalition government, which means even if all the coalition partners vote together, we still don't have 50%. And there's seven different parties in that coalition. In other cases, uh, Tuane, we do have a majority. There's six parties in there. But in a place like Nelson Mandela Bay, where there's a lot of pressure for the DA to go into government, it would be a 10-party coalition with nine of those parties having only 13 seats between them. So they are able to blackmail you on every single decision. It takes one person to say, I don't, I'm not getting anything out of this. I'm walking away to bring down your government. So we need to think very carefully, first of all, as voters about this fragmentation. Is this something that is sustainable? I think if you speak to the people in Nelson Mandela Bay who are going through the most intense version of this, I think a lot of people would say, look, I really regret voting for these um, very minor parties because they've made it impossible to govern the city. So I'd rather vote for someone who has a realistic chance of getting 50 or at least being part of a proper majority coalition. Um, so I think that's the big thing. I think the other thing um, that stands out is just how just, uh, you know, at the end of the book, I warn about the biggest risk basically being that we don't have a coalition culture in South Africa. You know, we're not used to doing this. We don't know how this works. We had one party government under the National Party for 40 years, 40 odd years. We've now had the same under the ANC for 25, 28 years. So we really need a new understanding of, of how this works. How do you actually govern with multiple parties in there? And this applies to every political party. And so what we've seen uh, is obviously instability leading up to the 2021 election. And although I, I personally believe that the DA is doing a, a Herculean task of keeping coalitions in Gauteng especially together, you know, there is a lot of uh, a maneuvering and, and sort of, uh, you know, the people who are, you are working with are your partners, but in many cases also try to be your biggest opponents. And that's really bad for stability. We're going to have to find a good midpoint between those two, where, of course, you know, you must continue to democratically compete. But I think voters need to take note and really get to a point where they not only think about fragmentation and the dangers that goes with it, but actually punish people who really just destroy coalitions or seek to undermine them for their own short term benefit. So I think voters, political party leaders, but also voters really have to um, navigate this new reality. Mm. And I mean, it's sort of my job to listen to as many podcasts as I can, especially um, based in South Africa. And I hear, especially amongst the younger people, what's the point of voting? I mean, the system is broken. Why should I vote? Um, it, it doesn't work. So what would be your response to that? Because I mean, it seems like in local election, it's almost like less than a third of the people in South Africa voted in that election. So my answer is very, very simple. For the first time in our democracy, the ANC is heading to lose a national election. So for 25, 28 years, it's basically been guaranteed that the ANC is going to come out victorious in every election. The question was just how big their majority would be. But what we're seeing now 
is the ANC, like I said, already lost their majority in 2021. And in 2024, it's going to be the most exciting election we've ever had because everyone, and including commentators and the media, are actually expecting the ANC to lose. They're expecting them to get less than 50%. And, and most definitely in, in certain provinces like Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal, in addition to the Western Cape, obviously. So it is, it is a moment of enormous change in our politics. And I know that people get really despondent about all the problems, and trust me, I do as well. Um, but fortunately, I'm in the position where I try to do some, something about them. Um, but at the same time, you know, we mustn't lose sight of the enormous change that's actually taking place sort of right beneath our feet. And the opportunity we have and the challenge we have in 2024 is to make sure that this change goes in a positive direction. Because, you know, you can talk about change, but change can be good or bad. You don't, you know, change fundamentally, you know, you're not saying in which way it's going to go. So we agree that change is happening, I think. What is now necessary is for people to come out and vote in massive numbers in 2024 to take that change in a positive direction. And it's very concrete. What it means is that the DA needs to be the strongest block in other provinces so that we can start forming governments outside of the Western Cape. We have started doing it now in Umgeni, in KwaZulu-Natal. We run a municipality in Limpopo, which we've done actually since 2016. We run, uh, we're in coalitions in the Northern Cape. We're in Gauteng. We run the Western Cape. So the DA's footprint is actually already expanded quite significantly. But that shows you the opportunity we've got in 2024 to make sure that in Gauteng, we install a new coalition government with the DA really at the core so that we're as strong as possible to push that change in a positive direction. The same in other provinces and even nationally. The risk, of course, is if opposition voters become so disillusioned by all the problems, which obviously are, are manifest, that they don't show up to vote. The ANC is likely, even in that scenario, to still not get 50%, but then you may have the EFF being the strongest um, block or, or really emerging out of this uncertainty in a stronger way. Or perhaps other parties that, that are sort of maybe not uh, real threats right now, but which could become kind of radical sort of EFF uh, surrogates. Um, and, you know, then the change that we're going through might go in a very negative direction where the EFF starts forming part of these governments with the ANC or some kind of other scenario. So my answer in short is change is not on the horizon. It is absolutely happening as we speak. The ANC is going down. It's going down big time and faster and faster every day. Now is our opportunity to make sure that we get a new government with the DA in the core of that government and with other parties, frankly, who also want to see South Africa succeed and then we can really start to rebuild things. So I'm optimistic in that sense, um, but it's a race against time. We, we have to get uh, over that line as soon as possible because we know the country really can't survive five, 10 more years of what's currently going on. Leon, what, on that note, what's going on in Gauteng? Because as I understood it, you guys are not interested in working with the EFF, but yet you accepted their vote to, to establish mayors in Kuruleni, Johannesburg, Pretoria, and I think even Mogul City. So. What's, yeah. what's the situation there? So that was an interesting one. Again, one of these uh, coalition country scenarios that I did not envision where, you know, there was no negotiation with the EFF. There was no request for their vote. None of that was happening. And out of pure strategic, his own strategic reasons, Julius Malema decided to rather vote for the DA candidates than for the Joburg, uh, for, than for the, the ANC candidates. And this happened in, an, in a number of places that you've mentioned. So, um, what we ended up with is being in government with the EFF voting us in, but with no agreement or cooperation. And so the EFF is not part of any of our governments in Gauteng. Now, we are not naive about why this happened. This happened because Malema is playing his own game. And it's very much part of what I just said. The EFF understands that the ANC is going down and they want a situation where Cyril Ramaphosa gets blamed for the ANC going down. And so that's why they are busy strengthening the DA's hand in some cases, because they are trying to fuel factionalism within the ANC and for the ANC uh, to suffer as a result. So the, remember, when the ANC is out of government in these places, they lose massive amounts of patronage. You know, they lose in a place like Johannesburg with multi-billion rand budgets. They lose the ability to actually 
um, steal money from tenders and fuel their whole system and fund the party. So Malema is doing these things to weaken the ANC and specifically to weaken Cyril Ramaphosa. And we are under no illusions about that. But we'll take the opportunity that's been given. And that's where the challenge comes in. We now have to make this plan essentially backfire on Julius Malema by showing that our governments are working, by showing that these DA-led coalitions, these multi-party governments are the model for the future. And that by 2024, enough people understand this, that they would rather go with this DA approach than actually uh, a sort of going RET faction or EFF. So, you know, as you can hear, there's, uh, there's no illusions or naivety about what happened there. Uh, and certainly there was no uh, understanding or agreement with the EFF, but now our challenge is to make the best out of uh, what we've been given. So Leon, it, as a journalist, it's my job to play sort of devil's advocate. And I've recently read Michael Beaumont. I think that's a sermon in his book, the chairperson of a party that shall not be named about um, how he said that there's a big difference between the EFF at local government level and national level, that the EFF is actually mm -hmm. a very trustworthy partner at municipal level, but they don't see working with them at a national level. So you can trust them mm -hmm. in places like Johannesburg, Pretoria, Tswane, and these places, but uh, I mean, you can understand why you would not want to work with them in, the, in Pretoria and, and the national government. So what would your response be to that? Yeah, that, that's a totally fair question. Um, I, I, I'm not familiar with the total argument, so I'll just respond to sort of the way that you framed it now. But I fundamentally disagree with it for the following reason. There is no different EFF. The, the EFF is not a democratic organization. The EFF doesn't elect its leaders in any kind of democratic way. The EFF is Julius Malema. And what Malema says goes. And, you know, we've seen it so many times. He disbanded the entire Eastern Cape province, provincial structures of the, of the EFF when they challenged him, or Limpopo, in fact, sorry. Um, he has, I mean, you know, if you're in parliament, you see new EFF members almost on a weekly basis because he just fires people from parliament. You never read about it in the media. Can you just imagine if the DA was behaving in that kind of dictatorial way, um, what would be in the media? But that's how the EFF is run. It's a fact. This is not conjecture. That's how it's run. So what happens in Johannesburg or in any local council is on the, based on the wishes of Julius Malema. And if his wishes are not executed, that person will be gone tomorrow. You won't even get a WhatsApp. That person will just be gone. That is the fact uh, 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 on the ground. So I think it is extremely naive, extremely naive when you see this is how a political party operates. Um, and by the way, a political party whose policy platform is absolutely destructive in every possible conceivable way. The EFF is the opposite of the DA. They are the ones trying to use this moment of flux to essentially turn South Africa into a, some kind of Venezuela uh, situation. So the EFF is not different at local level. The EFF is an extension of Malema at provincial, national and local level. And what they're doing locally is exploiting naivety or whatever may lie behind these statements to further the goals of Julius Malema. And so, you know, you, we saw this in the, in, when, when, uh, when the EFF was part of this arrangement in Johannesburg, for example, it, with these massive land grabs taking place under the former mayor that were taking place precisely because the EFF understood that the people had bought into their argument and now they could get away with all of these things. And, and, and they were doing that. So I think history shows the EFF cannot be trusted, whether that's nationally or locally. We've certainly learned our lesson on that. But more fundamentally, if you understand what the EFF is, a more intense, more radical version of the ANC's worst instincts, which is centralization, which is you know, extremely radical economic policies, then you wouldn't be so naive about who the EFF is at any level of government. Uh, and I think that would be my response. Uh, the EFF goes as Julius Malema goes. And if you can trust Malema, then good luck with that. I, I certainly don't think DA voters ever signed up for that kind of thing. And frankly, many other opposition voters. Leon, many, many individuals, especially in the West of Cape, where the two of us are from, they see this chaos in the rest of South Africa, this coalition governments, all those councillors you, you said are in um, Durban, that, I mean, it's chaotic to form a coalition there. 
And they say, yeah. this is the reason why we need to break away. That's why we need Cape independence. We need a new um, country here in the Western Cape where we don't have to deal with these issues. So how would you respond to that? So I understand the impulse. I mean, I, I understand the impulse very clearly. If you look at what's happening in the rest of South Africa and you look at, you know, if you just have to visit, you know, the parts of the Free State or Northwest or wherever, and you'll see the, the decline. Just today, the DA was in the Northern Cape somewhere where there's actually uh, a lake of sewerage running over the road. You know, not water, but actually just a sewerage dam that's formed there. So there, there are no illusions about the state of service delivery or infrastructure in many other, other parts of the country. So I think that's where the impulse comes from. The issue, however, is that there are ways to insulate the Western Cape and other places where the DA governs, like Ungeni, for example, that don't require you to actually turn your back on many other good people in the rest of South Africa. Now, the ways to do that is being demonstrated, I think, very practically by the DA's new mayor in Cape Town, Jordan Hill Lewis, who, you know, just recently, last week, uh, got this extraordinary approval from the National Treasury to go ahead with a feasibility study on taking over the rail service. And is really leading that. Leon, when, when is yeah. that going to happen? Well, until now, there was no clear position uh, that actually even enabled the city of Cape Town to investigate whether it was possible. They were, they were even preventing that. Essentially, what has happened now is the finance minister not only gave approval to investigate this, but if it is proved to be feasible, then it must happen. And the new white paper on transport actually says that that, that passenger rail must be devolved by 2025. So we are going to relentlessly use this opportunity. I mean, it is about political will. I go back to what I said at the start. All of these things are possible if you are properly committed to making them happen. Now, in Cape Town, we're seeing that with rail. The other one that we're seeing it with in a more visceral way even um, is, is on electricity, um, on, on load shedding. The, you know, the first big tender has gone out for um, uh, independent producers of, of, of massive new electricity infrastructure for Cape Town. I know that, that they're working very hard on the storage solution. Um, I know they are, are considering the, the expansion on upgrading of Steenbras. So these are very, very real things that you will see in the next year or two, not 10 years down the line. You will see these things starting to happen. And if we get to a point, which I really fundamentally believe will happen soon, where we don't only protect Cape Town against one stage of load shedding, but we protect it against two and then three, and people see the progress that's being made in their own lives. They will understand, I think, that functional federalism, which has always been the position of the DA. This is not something new. We're not jumping on a bandwagon here. You know, we, this isn't something that, that just suddenly came up. It's always been, uh, you know, there's a reason our highest decision-making structure is called the Federal Council. That is how we, we view uh, the best way to govern South Africa. So on all these critical services from transport to electricity to policing, I mean, I can tell you some of the most amazing things that are going on on the ground in Cape Town and the Western Cape with the LEAP project. I mean, we've seen 44% decline in murder in a place like Arare in Kailicha. Now I know it's not eradicated. There are still these hor horrific things happening. But if you look at this most recent incident in Kailicha in Site C, our MEC, our new MEC was on the ground immediately and they are deploying 70 more local officers there. We are pushing the boundaries on policing just like we're doing it on these other critical functions. And the fruits will come, I think, sooner than people perhaps anticipate. And I understand the skepticism, I'm not dismissing it. Um, but my point is we will see progress on these federal, on, on functional federalism much, much sooner than we'll see progress on anything else, simply because it's practical, it's realistic, and it actually achieves the very same thing. Because fund fundamentally, what I believe people of the Western Cape want, they want to be safe, they want to have proper public transport, they want to have reliable and affordable electricity, and a few other critical things like that. That's what the real problem is. They don't want to lose those things, as has happened in the rest of the country. I would bet that we're busy demonstrating, and it will become very clear very soon, that we're doing all of those things without the massively expensive downsides of, of trying to secede. And at the end of the day, protecting uh, Captonians and the Western Cape in that way, and also other places where we govern. We must remember, I think we'll see 
the impulse for more powers in places like Umgeni or Pretoria also happening. When people start seeing, look what's happening in Cape Town and the Western Cape. We have DA governments. Let's also do it there. You know, and then, you know, we don't want to rob Umgeni or Pretoria or Johannesburg of these solutions. We, we certainly want to bring it to people there as well. Uh, I think that's really just a win-win situation. But at the same time, I understand the impulse. Yeah, fair point. Leon, I, I see our time is running out. I want to ask you one last question. You probably know Rob Ayrshoff is the, the billionaire in South Africa. He recently made a point where he said that young South Africans, um, if you can leave the country, do it. I mean, you can always return. And I mean, you're, you're a person that I believe you've, you've worked at Princeton University in the United States. You've been to Germany. What would your response be to that? What would you say? Is, is that a fair point? Do you, can you just leave South Africa and return? Or oh yeah, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, I don't think it's so easy to return because, um, you know, if you start building a life somewhere else, uh, it does become very difficult. And, and I was in a fortunate situation where I was, you know, still very young. I was studying and I was doing a job that had involved a lot of traveling. And so I hadn't quite settled um, in my personal life to that extent. But I think it's different um, once you actually settle down somewhere else. That, that, that does become a different um, scenario. So look, I mean, again, I understand the impulse. We, we can all see what's happening in South Africa. And I certainly don't begrudge anyone who tries to go somewhere else and, and, and make a better living for them and their families. But I would just say that we are in this moment of incredible change and opportunity in our political reality right now. And I think that there are many young South Africans who, like me, really desperately want this country to succeed and are really willing to give it a very, very hard shot right now that we know that it's actually possible to make these things happen. And so I can't speak for anyone else. I mean, I have lived abroad. I understand it. There are downsides to it as well. I mean, there are still wonderful things about living in South Africa. Um, but for me personally, the way I would answer the question is to say, there is so much opportunity in the air right now to do so many important things. And I'm trying to play my part as someone who's still relatively young, even though politics has made me prematurely very gray, uh, that that is a very strong motivator for me right now. I believe if we make the right decisions now, if we all become involved in our local environment and even politically involved, where many of us maybe don't want to really do that, um, now is really the moment to think again because in two years' time, we're going to have the opportunity to fundamentally change this country. And it's not a dream. It's not speculation. It is something that I wrote about in Coalition Country. It's something that's happening as we speak in our local governments. And I think there's every chance in the world that we're going to wake up and say, my goodness, there's a DA premier in Gauteng. Or, you know, the DA is part of government in this other province. The ANC is out. And even nationally, we might say, my goodness. Uh, there's a new government coming and a new way of doing things. What an incredible moment of opportunity and potential that would be. And even if you are abroad, if that moment does arrive and you play your part from abroad, because remember, South Africans overseas can also vote in national elections. Um, that would be the moment to really come back and help us make the best of this opportunity if we, we are able to pull it off with your and the voters' support. Uh, because that'll be a moment to really fundamentally put South Africa on a better track. That's what I'm looking forward to. And I think there are many other young South Africans who are also desperately working hard to make that happen. Well, thank you, Leon. Thank you so much for that optimistic message. And thank you so much for making the time. I'm sure you have a very busy schedule. Thank you so much for making the time to join us here on Worldview. To our listeners, you must certainly enjoy this content. If you made it as well, please consider liking this video, sharing as widely as possible and subscribing to our YouTube channel. My name is Donald and you've been watching Worldview.